live now. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Petra Kucha volume 33. Um, it's great to have you here. Um, this is our fourth live event now. I was just reminded by the fact that it was actually a year ago today that uh, we partnered up with London to run ahead and try this new frontier of doing uh, events on Zoom. Um, so it's great to see you here today, this evening. Um, as you may have seen on Twitter, I decided to do a brand refresh for, for Petra Kitchen Night Manchester uh, today. Um, so we've gone a bit yellow instead of orange. Um, but yeah, it's all because we're celebrating the power of colour today. So it's just gone 7 pm. So, 1st of April 2020, and we're live across the UK and indeed the world uh, out on YouTube. Uh, I want to thank you for, for tuning in uh, and talk a bit more about what we're doing over the course of this evening uh, over about two hours or so. Um, but first of all, for those who are joining us for the first time, what is Petrakusha? Or some may, others may say Pachaksha. Um, I think I've awfully mangled that, but Mark, who's on the call, will be able to correct me later. It's a Japanese word for chit chat. And the idea behind it is simple. Over the course of an evening, we get a group of people together to talk about one topic, and they talk about stories around that topic or that theme, um, but they can only use 20 images and 20 seconds per image, and they cannot stop. So today, uh, we've got a group of speakers who are here to talk around the power of colour. And I have to give a shout out to Lovish uh, on my team for coming up with uh, a brilliant theme. Uh, for this evening, because we want to celebrate colour and what it means to us as humans and indeed animals in some respects, but also importantly to continue championing uh, people and creators of colour, particularly because that's part of our mission here uh, at, at Petra Kuchin Night Manchester to sort of celebrate diversity uh, as well in all its forms. Um, our event is one of many that take place across the world. Uh, there are now, I think, 1,200 cities that uh, run events, uh, mainly online at the moment, uh, and we're really, really pleased to be a part of it. Um, so tonight, you'll be hearing stories from biologists, from architects, illustrators, graphic designers, and community makers. Uh, so stick around. Uh, it's going to be a really interesting evening. Um, I should say, uh, as ever, because our events are a bit chaotic sometimes, the lineup has changed slightly. So you may have seen Annette Joseph uh, on the lineup and Katie Morrison. Unfortunately, they can't make it tonight, uh, but we'll get them back uh, in the future. But we do have one additional special guest, which is uh, Mark Dytham, who is the uh, one of the founders of uh, the whole Petra Kucha, uh, event. And it's really great to have him here because he's in Japan. I think it's nearly 3 a.m. Uh, so I don't know why I'm still awake. Um, but as I think I described um, before, he's indefatigable, if we can say that word. Um, so it'd be great to, to see him speak. And just on that front, I just want to sort of pay tribute to the team over in, in Tokyo because they recently, for the uh, birthday of Petra Kucha, uh, on the 20th of February, ran an event all around the theme of love. And they did it for 24 hours. So Manchester and other uh, cities joined together to do a continuous run of talks uh, throughout the day and they're all on YouTube now that's the other thing is you can go back and rewatch loads of these so I just wanted to pay tribute to to that work and the team there who stayed up for a very very long time um, okay so I think that's that's really it from what I wanted to sort of say at the the outset um, other than please uh, you know engage with social media for those on YouTube uh, you know, engage in the chat, tell us where you're from, say hello, champion the speakers. These people are giving up their time uh, for free uh, as volunteers to tell their stories. So we're really grateful. So please do um, say thank you to them. Um, if you want to use hashtags, PKNMCR33 is what we've got for this evening. Um, so I'm just going to check my notes to make sure there is nothing else left. Um, so yeah, we're going to have five speakers in the first half four speakers uh, in the last half. We're gonna move on to some community shout outs uh, in a sec, so I'll hand over the mic uh, to those people. Uh, and in the middle, we've got a special um, guest. We've got uh, Jada Giwa, who spoke last year at our migration event, uh, who's prepared a really special video for us to, today. So we'll push out, but also put on the links, because as ever with Zoom, it gets a bit 
weird and wobbly. So actually you can watch it on YouTube in the break as well. So it'll be about a 10 minute break there for you uh, to do that as well. So I'm just gonna move on to shout outs. Um, and the first person I've got is Katie from the Creative Mental Network. So if you can unmute, I will mute myself. And you've got two minutes, strictly two minutes. We've got to keep this time. Uh, but it's so great to have you here. We love the work of Creative Mental Network and they're branching out to the parts of the country and we want to support what they're doing now. So over to you, Katie. Thanks, Kyle. Um, I will be very quick. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, just want to say I'm really happy to be here um, and looking forward to this evening. Um, so as Kyle said, I'm from Creative Mental Network. Um, we are a charity who um, have a mission to make the creative industry more inclusive and more accessible. So um, we work with young people from low socioeconomic backgrounds and we partner with businesses such as Soho House, Sony Music, Amazon Prime Video, Facebook. And what we do is we, um, we introduce our young people with the creative professionals from these businesses and facilitate mentoring programs. We know that through kind of experience and research that formal mentoring can create real change. Um, and we also train our mentors in areas such as mentoring and coaching, inclusive leadership, how to support junior diverse talent coming into the business. Um, so we are really looking for more mentors and more young people to support and especially outside of London. We know it's really tricky to enter the creative industry um, anyway, but it's also very London centric and we are trying to change that. So if anyone is keen to be involved, um, please contact me. Um, I think my email address is going to be dropped into the YouTube kind of comments and chat section. So please drop me an email and I'm more than happy to have a call or answer any questions. And that's me. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Um, but yeah, please, please get in touch with the Creative Mental Network. And uh, yeah, if you've got any questions, you've got, you've got Katie's email address. Uh, if you miss it, drop us a line on, on Twitter and we'll make the connection for you. Okay, uh, let's go next. I hope Evan made it. Um, are you there? Hello. Hello. Did you sign in as Imogen? <laughs> Yes, using my partner's, right. uh, my partner's login today. <laughs> That's fine. Um, over to you, Stock Up Mucker. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so we are Mucker. Uh, we are a team of uh, creatives across the city who have created this uh, basically cultural platform and hub uh, to talk about all of the great independent and DIY things going on in Manchester from artists to musicians, writers and builders. We wanna talk about all the stuff going on behind the scenes uh, that isn't really put into the limelight. Uh, so we only started in December. And of course, since that time, we've had to do everything um, digitally. So we've made our website and we've done a series of interviews, articles, radio shows, playlists uh, and podcasts just to highlight all the great stuff going on. But as the world opens up, we have got much uh, bigger plans to become a community interest company. I think Laura can tell you a bit more about the bigger side of the plans. Hello. So yeah, we, we started out as um, doing articles and that kind of thing. And um, obviously with everything that's happened, it's just been restricted. So we wanted to kind of integrate more into the community we exist in. Um, find out different things that are missing, um, things that people would like to get involved with or things that people would like to see happen. Um, I think we'll start off in our local community and then hopefully we can work with different housing associations because I'm from a housing association background and currently do um, some work on the community side of things at the minute. Um, so it's, it's you know a passion of, passion of ours really to put ourselves out there in terms of what we can help improve the communities. So yeah. looking at working with different housing associations and, and seeing mm -hmm. how we can like facilitate things to happen and you know give people tools and, and connect and resources to do to do more stuff. So through yeah uh, gigs, exhibitions, workshops and really just being a facilitator for all good things in the community. Well thank you very That's much for having us. No, that's all right. Thank, thank you. And uh, it's, it's great that we sort of connect over Instagram. Uh, all your details are there on the slide um, as well. Uh, hopefully, people have a bit of time to write it down. Uh, but yeah, 
look at MCR, uh, just head to Instagram and you can find more information. Yeah, thank you, thank you again. For you. Thank you very much. Okay, catch you later. Okay, next, uh, John, are you around? Hey, yeah, thanks for inviting us on. Um, it's obviously quite an unusual year of us all being separated um, and especially for us at Design Manchester because um, like everyone, we've had to try and pivot to a lot of our projects online. Um, what's weird about us all having to do that is weirdly, even though we're all kind of separated, it's brought us all a lot more closer uh, together. And what's happened with us with Design Manchester is it's accelerated a lot of conversations we were having with other cities and, and other festivals around the world. Um, and one such one is we uh, are collaborating with Nairobi Design Week, which kicks off tomorrow. Um, and tomorrow we're going to um, launch a joint project, which we've been working with with Nairobi Design Week in the British Council uh, called Doing Zero. Uh, it's a climate action collaboration between uh, Nairobi being the Kenyan capital and North Manchester Harper A, which uh, I never thought would ever link two of those places ever uh, in my lifetime, never, never, may, uh, you know, actually be part of a project with them either. Um, but because of these virtual connections and the way we're all working, it means that we can actually link with people in Nairobi and we are planning to do a lot of stuff with other more far-flung cities. Um, so the results of the collaboration are going to launch tomorrow um, at three o'clock at Nairobi Design Week. Um, and part of, part of that collaboration is uh, working with a host of other people like Standard Practice, SICK Festival, Manchester Climate uh, Change Agency, and there'll be a lot of knowledge sharing through design, uh, workshops, and some special virtual work, which we'll unveil tomorrow. Um, so yeah, if you want to see kind of what we're up to, if you go on designmcr.com, um, or if you follow us on social media, uh, you'll see the project launch tomorrow and how you can get involved. Cheers. Thanks so much, John. Uh, yeah, uh, and keeping out for, for that. Um, Tomorrow, uh, we've, we've worked a lot with Design Manchester and, and Standard Practices. I've done talks for us uh, in the past as well. So it's uh, great to see more work happening from, from their side. Uh, one thing I failed to do at the start was to say thank you to a lot of people. So I'm just going to very quickly go through. So thank you, to, obviously, to the speakers for giving up their time. I think I said that before. Uh, thank you to you as the audience coming here. Uh, and thank you to the Vegkucha team as well in Manchester who've helped bring all this together um you know you can't you can't do it without without you all and a special shout out to brogan from london who is being our tech support today making sure everything connects as well and so she'll be uh talking in the chat to you as well and putting all the links in there um okay so let's kick off um so we've got our first speaker uh today which is vanessa um Vanessa actually did uh, a, a table for us. We partnered with Yard Manchester and we sort of had a, a live sort of table demonstration where Vanessa decorated it uh, whilst the talk's going on. So uh, that was really cool. And we said, oh, we need you to come and do a talk for us. And finally, she is here. Um, and she's also on CBeebies uh, doing a, a special show about red, which I thought was very uh, poignant for this uh, event. So Vanessa, are you, are you ready to go? Well, yes, I think so. Yes. <laughs> well, and, and happy birthday, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, right. If this all this is a big test now, so um, if it all goes well, um, it'll be fine. So if you say when, I'll press the button, and it will start, and you will finish in seven minutes, and it will be happy. And it'll be fantastic. Okay. Cool. All right then. Go. Okay, so here are some things about me then. So I love learning and I class researching as a chill time activity. And then I also have an absolute obsession with communication. So effective communication strategies, verbal, visual, nonverbal, everything. And I also love colour and communities. And that is colourful clothes, colourful hair, colourful spaces, literally colour in all of its applications. But where that becomes a bit strange is when I tell you that I actually hate colouring in. That is actually the title of my talk. I hate colouring in. And it, it seems a bit strange that I hate colouring in when I'm very well known for doing bright, colourful artworks. 
So I tried to figure out like, how did this happen? How did I be known for colorful artworks, but hate coloring in? And that's not just strange to hear, but it's also strange when I tell you that I actually have stacks and stacks of coloring books, um, which just seemed really weird. Um, but it won't be strange to you when I tell you that none of them are actually colored in. And where that gets stranger is that people around me find this a bit odd as well. And a few weeks ago, my friend who loves puzzles uh, got a puzzle which you colour in. And she fairly enough assumed that I would be interested in the colouring in, but I actually wasn't, as I've just told you. What I was interested in, however, was the colour theory book that comes along with the puzzle. And I immersed myself in that. So I tried to figure out what was going on with me hating colouring in, but loving colour in all of its applications. And I dialed back to some discoveries. And that's what I'm gonna tell you about. So my first discovery is that color is confidence. And I remember learning this about eight years old when my mom, who was a restaurant manager at the time, uh, I was waiting for her after work and these girls came in and they were covered head to toe in color. Even their shoes were colorful. And I was particularly dressing all in black at the time. And I just thought, wow, they look so confident. So that was my first discovery that color can resonate confidence. The next discovery, which was when I was starting my public art career, is that color is community. And as, you, as I told you before, I'm quite obsessed with research. So when I was starting my public art career, I researched everything about public art. Who did it? What did they do? Where did they do it? And I came across this project, the Favela Painting Project by Haas and Hahn. And they literally united communities with color. They brought everyone together. They didn't have to be artists and they painted their community in bright colors. This is their project in Rio. And there's also an example of their project in Philadelphia. And I was like, right, okay, color in communities. I just love that. So that was my next discovery. Color is confidence, color is community. And then I actually discovered that color was powerful. And I only realized just how powerful color was to me when I didn't have access to it anymore. And this happened when I was admitted to hospital. So I was admitted to A&E and I ended up being in hospital for four days unexpectedly. And it was horrible anyway. I mean, the nurses were lovely, it was clean, but it wasn't a great experience as you can imagine. But it was made worse by the fact that everything around me was blue, blue and white. Even the floor was cream. There was no color around me. And it had such a negative effect on me. It made me feel worse. So much so that when my mom came to visit, I begged her <laughs> on her next visit to please, mom, bring me in one of my colorful silk scarves, please. And she did. And I draped it across my bed. I wrapped it in my hair. And immediately it made such a difference to me. It just elevated my mood, elevated how I felt. And I was thinking, wow, color is really powerful to me. And I think I took it for granted how much color I have around me and how important it is. So at this stage, I had discovered that color resonates confidence. I had discovered that color helps unite communities. And I had discovered that color was powerful to me, but truly I still could not stand coloring in. And it didn't make sense to me. <laughs> So eventually it did click and I figured this out. Just let me refer to these. This is really key. What I figured is that color and applying color to a design isn't actually about coloring in at all. It's about conversation. It's about how when you put blue and yellow stripes on a screen with red dots over the yellow, it looks different to when the red is over the blue. It's about a conversation when you fill a screen with red, with yellow and blue dots and how if you stare at those dots, I'm telling you, stare at these dots right now. If you stare at these dots for long enough, they start to vibrate and move on the screen and eventually they will go green. Keep looking. <laughs> it's about things like the Bezold effect and optical mixing. It's about how, like, look at these. Why does the red look different than when it's on the black, than when it's on the white? All of these conversations are happening. 
It's about how the color yellow will almost always make people feel happy. And it's about how the old adage of red and green should never be seen isn't actually that true because it depends on what red and it depends on what green. All of these things are about conversations with color, frequencies of light, uh, densities of pigment, not about coloring in at all. So when I dialed it back and I actually realized that applying color to a design or a space isn't about coloring in at all. It's about using these amazing tools of color to help communicate a message, a mood, a tone, feeling and emotion. And once I realized that, my relationship with color has gone from strength to strength. Thank you. <laughs> Great <Lovely> presentation. Woo! <laughs> that was very interesting. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Well done. Um, Thank you. Drink water. <laughs> I think we're going to say this a lot during this evening, but colours free, why don't you use it? And uh, yeah. you really explain that uh, extremely well. Colours really important, as you'll see later in uh, our, our work. Um, uh, you know, we use a lot of colour. In fact, our office floor is bright yellow. Yeah. In, in our office. And that came, from, that came from back when I used to work for Milton Keynes Development Corporation when I was 16 to 18, and they had a bright yellow floor. And that was all about the energy you got in the morning, walking in and feel, feeling like you're walking on a bed of uh, buttercups or sunflowers, and it gave you this en energy. So uh, I really appreciated your presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Mark. Thanks. <laughs> so. Great. Um, I was reminded to stop sharing my screen so we can see each other's faces. I think so. Thanks, Brooke, for reminding me about, about doing that. Um, Vanessa, one thing, your, your talk reminded me of that whole debate about that dress. You know, it was like blue or gold. Yes, exactly. That, <laughs> that was a big thing. <laughs> but I think you're right that hospitals really need to think about what they're doing. And everybody's so shy of colour, you know, and there's, there's no reason to be. Um, and uh -huh. really, really depressing. <laughs> it was awful. I, and I didn't realise until I was like, whoa why is everything blue or white and then the pattern on the curtain was just blue I was like no <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna talk I'm gonna talk about that Vanessa it's a shame you didn't get into one of our one of our hospitals oh yeah you, you, you'll, you'll you'll see the difference, you'll see oh, the difference. Good. so someone's <laughs> doing it then someone's fixing yeah. the blue and white yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> good. plenty of yellow plenty of yellow right <laughs> yeah well, that's well, bad. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, this is where this is where the technical failings may start to happen. Is I'm gonna start jumping between <laughs> screens. Bear with me for one second. Okay, everyone, close your eyes because you'll get a bit of a preview of one of the screens. Uh, Richard, are you there? Right, I am here. Yes. R Richard, a AKA Rachel from Petrucucha Manchester's team's dad. Um, oh I think we said at one point, like, it'd be really cool if we could get do a Petra Kutra event with all of our like parents to do a talk. And that's a fantastic <laughs> idea. <laughs> we'll talk a lot about how we manifest. Um, Rachel, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> you just embarrassed my daughter. Huh? <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I've got a reputation to uphold, Dad. Oh God! Well, I just trash. I'm about to trash that for you. So. <laughs> Are you ready to go? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a talk about. Well, you'll see. You'll see. Let's go. Okay. Well, as Carl said, I'm Richard Cook. I'm a zoologist at Kingston University in London, and I'm just going to talk about some of the ways in which colour is used in the animal kingdom. And uh, unfortunately, coincidentally, just after I agreed to speak, the BBC released David Attenborough's Life in Colour series, which is not, hasn't made it the best act or the easiest act for me to follow, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, I want to first talk about what colour actually is, though. When you've all seen rainbows, you'll remember doing physics classes with glass prisms to separate out visible colours in light. And colours are really just a, a range of wavelength of electromagnetic radiation with different energies. And what we perceive as colour is really based on how there's wavelengths are detected and interpreted by our brains. Um, so what we see depends on which wavelengths are reflected off, off surfaces. So they, these can be reflected by structures and materials, which reflect and scatter, and scatter light, 
or they re are reflected by pigments. And the hummingbird's feathers and the jewel wasps here have many more colors than are possible from just pigments alone. They're due to the structural colors. And when light enters the eye, it hits the retina, which contains these cone cells with pigments. And these send electrical signals to the brain. And there's loads of processing that goes on in the eye and in the brain to measure the relative strengths of these signals, which are translated by the brain to, into a sense of color. So in a sense, color is a, a kind of construct of, the, of our brain. And there are also different types of eyes. So humans and other old world primates have trichromatic vision, which means we have three different types of cones. And these are excited by wavelengths that we call red, green, and blue. And the relative strengths of those signals received by the brain allow us to see the range of what we call visible colors. Other mammals are dichromatic and only have two types of cone cells and they, they lack red cones, so they can't see red. So your dog will see red and yellow balls, probably as some form of gray or green color and waving a red rag at a bull will do about as much good as waving a blue or a gray one. Although I would be a bit irritated if someone was waving a rag at me and trying to stab me with a spear, I guess. Um, many other vertebrate animals like fish and birds have three, four or even five types of cones, more than us, often meaning that they can see into ultraviolet light and polarized light as well as the red end of the spectrum. And this explains some of the great colors we see in the surface waters of the oceans, in coral reefs and in birds, for example. And they're very sensitive to all these different colors. Loads of other invertebrates have three to five cone cell types, such as spiders and dragonflies. Bees are trichromatic, but their sensitivity is shifted towards the blue and ultraviolet light, and they can't see red. And mantis shrimps have the, the greatest number of cone cells uh, of all animals that we know of, allowing them to uh, see a greater range of colors than, than any other animal. Um, and consequently, different animals see different uh, uh, colored objects differently. So the flower on the right is how we think a bee sees a flower that we see on the left. They can't see red, and so those stripes appear black, but they can see ultraviolet light, which we can't. So it's worth remembering actually that flowers evolved color to attract bees and other pollinators rather than us. This is an attempt to try and show what a mantis shrimp's view of the world looks like compared to ours. They've got more cone receptors and they can see a wide range of wavelengths, including ultraviolet light and polarized light, which allows them to detect the silhouettes of predators and prey much more easily than we can. And then how color is used in nature? Well, firstly, it's used for communication between individuals of a species. And most impressive probably are the displays by cephalopods, such as the squid here. And they've got pigment cells all over their body, controlled by the brain, that they use to display their moods, such as anger, arousal, and excitement, as well as for camouflage and something. There's a sophisticated language going on. T a tiger uses color and patterns to break up the shape to hide it. And an octopus is well known for its camouflage uh, abilities. And this crab spider on the right is perfectly camouflaged to ambush their insect prey. And they can even change color if they happen to land on a, on a different flower, different colored flower. And then there's camouflage by prey to hide from predators. So we've got this wonderfully camouflaged leaf, uh, leaf-tailed gecko at the top that looks like a leaf. And then peppered moths that are camouflaged against tree barks. Frogs are often cryptically colored. Snow hares even change color with the seasons so they don't stand out too much. And animals use color multifunctionally as well. So as well as camouflage, um, chameleons use their color to, for temperature, temperature regulation. So they'll go darker to absorb light and warm up and then uh, lighter when they want to cool down. And they also use color to display to other chameleons for aggression and for sexual displays. And of course, sex is a really important part of color in the animal kingdom. It displays the health and virility and in most sexual species, there's competition by males for females. So color can be a sign of male dominance, or it can be used as to, to attract females, such as we see in the bird of paradise and the peacock here, uh, to display their virility. It's also used extensively for defense in startle displays. So eye spots, as we see in the peacock butterfly, are used to startle predators to give the chance uh, to, to escape. The puss moth caterpillar rears up this alarming looking head and can also eject formic acid. The praying mantis has a threat pose and cuttlefish can change their colors. And some of the prettiest animals are actually the most dangerous. Color is used as a warning of poison or some other unpleasant defense. And predators learn to associate their bright color with that unpleasant experience and then avoid them. So we see poisonous frogs, the blister beetle, and so on. I've lost my screen. Oh, there we are. Uh, um, yeah, and we've got the black widow, uh, spider, and the anemone clownfish, all warning of, of, of poisons. 
Um, this on my screen has got a bit out of sequence. Um, and we've, there's also the cinnabar moth as well. These are, are animals that feed on plants containing toxins and they store these toxins in their body um, and, and are brightly colored <coughs> because they're distasteful when a predator comes along and tries to eat them. And there are more, there's the monarch butterfly that stores toxins. We've got sea slugs that are well known for being brightly colored, but they store all the little stinging cells they, they, from their um, coral um, uh, prey. And the blue ringed octopus is normally camouflaged and hidden away, but if it's disturbed, it goes yellow and flashes these blue rings. But it's so common, this kind of warning thing, is that, that there are many cheats that mimic the poisonous species, even though they don't contain poisons themselves. So, for example, the red milk snake mimics a deadly coral snake. The viceroy butterfly, which is perfectly edible, looks like a monarch butterfly. The bee fly resembles a bee. The hoverfly resembles a wasp. And I think one of the most interesting aspects of um, light in the, in the um, natural world is bioluminescence. And you'll be familiar with fireflies that produce light to attract mate. There's also uh, phosphorescence by, dino, by dinoflagellate algae, which phosphor, uh, bioluminate uh, when, when you disturb water. And in the deep ocean, loads of light is produced by different animals. Phew, right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice, Richard. Smashed it. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Too much to say. Uh, only I didn't have a straight brain. Amazing. Woo! Well done. <laughs> yeah, that's, that okay. was really, I didn't know that dogs don't, you know, don't have a, a full set of cones, as, as it were. No. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. But that yeah. explains quite a lot, you know, and, and, and other animals can see more colours than we can. You know, it's so completely that's... different to the, oh, the way that many other cool. animals see the world, yeah. No, great presentation, and you don't, I mean, it's it's way better than a TED talk, and you don't have to watch the whole of the David at, at Attenborough show, you can just go, <laughs> it. it's six like minutes and 40 seconds, that's fantastic. Yeah, this period that I've never drawn <laughs> breath, trying to squeeze all. <laughs> no, you go into the protracted bubble then, pop out <laughs> the other side, and not quite sure what you said. Yeah. But yeah, that was fascinating, and it explains a lot of things, so thank you, thank you very much. Pleasure. No, thank you so much, I think, that, that's why I sort of love this this topic it seems like you can look at it so many different angles so thank you thank you richard so much for uh illuminating hey rachel you have a very cool dad i know i just wish i'd inherited <laughs> from that brain and he's never been able to be told he's cool by any of my friends before so you're, you're <laughs> first. <laughs> but i know that he's told him he's cool very good I successfully put both my daughters off science there somehow <laughs> oh, yeah we both you. turned well i turned creative somehow so instead of science uh, right, let's keep going with the show. So uh, I think it's David next. Uh, let me share my screen first. All right. David, are you ready to go? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, no, I, I, I think, David, I, I came across your... It came across you in the Lucian Ledger newspaper, and it's like a fortuitous like message, and you replied, and thank you so much for, for your book. So um, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but I, I just think it's uh, a beautiful book, and I'm so glad you're here to talk about thank you. that experience. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, are you ready to go? Yes, yeah, yeah, let's go. All right, go. Cool, so I'm uh, David Biscott. I'm an illustrator and cartoonist, and I've been working uh, mainly as an illustrator for the best part of a decade, uh, primarily in sort of editorial and advertising contexts for clients such as The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Guardian, uh, Apple, Google, uh, Facebook, all sorts of other things. Uh, but today I'm going to talk to you about my book, There's Only One Place This Road Ever Ends Up, uh, which was released last year. It's a graphic memoir so a graphic novel which is autobiographical and it's about myself and my partner Hannah. Um, so uh, we've been together just under a decade as well, uh, you can see both of us here, um, but this book is about a very specific period in our lives um, that I guess is a relatively unique experience to us um, and that I hadn't seen uh, sort of written about a huge amount before in, in, in other media in general. So in 2018, Hannah's bladder stopped working after a routine medical procedure went badly wrong. She had to have a permanent catheter surgically installed and a device attached to her spine to regulate the um, nerve pain and was prescribed morphine for the daily pain. 
Um, her condition was diagnosed as chronic, and we were told we would have to get used to her being newly disabled and having to have regular operations every few months. Um, so the first six months or so before this period, when she was diagnosed, was pretty intense. We were in hospital every few days. She lost her job and had to learn to walk with a stick. We were using a catheter and just generally acclimatized to being newly disabled and in constant agonizing pain. Um, and so eventually we were told there was nothing more they could do to make her better. And um, we realized that she was gonna be ill for the rest of her life, uh, which is obviously quite strange and fairly tricky to come to terms with when you're, uh, as we were then, we were in our late twenties now, sort of in our um, early thirties. So still sort of pretty young for a, a diagnosis of that magnitude. Um, so this book is about being relatively young and having to readjust to a new life of chronic illness, disability, constant surgery, and I guess just the processes you go through to accept such a bleak prognosis and um, to acclimatize to a different way of life to what you're used to. Uh, so in the book, I wanted to give perspective on uh, different aspects of our lives. Uh, so for example, Hannah has to have a catheter changed uh, under general anesthetic in an operation every few months. And as anyone who's been through similar moments of medical crisis knows, one of the coping mechanisms, you develop a sort of dark gallows humor around the whole thing. Um, but one thing that was really important for me to include um, was learning to renegotiate the world as someone who is now disabled. Um, something like finding it very hard to travel on public transport, where people generally aren't particularly understanding, particularly here in London, where we live, um, which was a real eye opener. And we've certainly got into a lot of arguments both on public transport and more generally just sort of facing the abuse that Hannah tends to get um, because she walks with a stick but looks relatively healthy. Um, for example, scenes like this at Glastonbury Festival, um, often people say she shouldn't be somewhere or they feel the need to tell her she's faking being ill to get benefits, um, which is a strange point of view. Um, it's important for me to include these more shocking elements of, of being disabled. Um, uh, for example, a scene like this, um, this is a scene, uh, Hannah fell downstairs and she's got an electric device attached to her spine, which is meant to regulate the pain. Uh, but when she fell here, it jammed against her spine and temporarily paralyzed her, which was obviously um, fairly, fairly scary. Um, and yeah, I also wanted to talk about the sort of big real life implications of a situation like ours. Um, so yeah, as I said, we're in our early thirties. So considerations of things like what it means for our ability to start a family weighed quite heavily over uh, writing the book, um, particularly as the damage in Hannah's body is in her pelvis. Um, and just, you know, the general feeling that our life was being put on hold. Um, a lot of our friends were getting married, buying houses and having kids. Uh, but for various reasons, Hannah's condition put up roadblocks for these normal uh, life events, which particularly during the first year or so was very hard to deal with. Um, but at the same time, what I wanted to include and what in this, this book in a way helped me sort of realize was that we could still have joy in our lives. You know, like we weren't sure we'd be able to do normal things. Like for example, going on holiday, which you can see here, we went to Lisbon. So in a way stuff like that feels more special and more important when it's in the context of a slightly trickier existence overall. Um, and other, you know, other things like this become bigger moments. So this is again at Glastonbury. Uh, so we always managed to get a day ticket for the Sunday because Hannah's dad lives nearby. And so after some pretty horrible verbal, verbal abuse earlier in the day, Hannah managed to dose up on, on just the right amount of morphine to be able to sort of boogie around her stick, as you can see in the previous slide now. Um, and then just the smaller things that an experience like this gives you, I guess. So in a relationship where one person has become sort of more of a carer, sometimes the wheels can come off a little, um, but the strength that just generally living through these things engenders and builds up means you're able to support each other in, in different ways. And um, so the process of writing the book uh, was intrinsic in coming to terms with this long term. And the idea that sometimes things may be really traumatic and awful, but we can still have a meaningful and joyful life together as well. And eventually, as is beginning to be the case now, we can sort of get on with our lives and this bad thing is just one element of it. Uh, in fact, as I was working on the book, uh, we got engaged. And uh, obviously as for many people last year, our wedding had to be postponed, but uh, fingers crossed, we'll be able to get married and sort of start getting on with the next chapter of our lives later on this year. Um, yeah, working on the book in general was a hugely rewarding experience. And um, since it's been released, it's been fascinating and sometimes quite moving to hear from people both in similar situations to ours and just those who've been moved by the story. Um, 
working on a, a book over the space of a year or two is quite an isolating experience, even if you're not in lockdown, as I was for some of it. But when it's finally unleashed, it's really nice to get that feedback, um, particularly when it's something so personal. So if you'd like to read it, you can buy a copy. And the best place to do that is at davidbiscupbooks.com. Uh, we can buy either a hardback or digital edition. And if you want to find out more about me or my other work, you can go to davidbiscupillustration.com. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Wow, what, what an inspiring and uplifting st story. You know, um, there's you. always a positive side to things. I think that's something that we find around the world with Pachakja and um, from a very difficult situation like that uh, to see uh, both your per perseverance and uh, the way that you can find joy in most things, you know, and I know there's very diff difficult times, but we, we you know, as, as, as a group of people in a thousand to 200 cities around the world, this is a general theme that we get, whether we have tsunami in Japan um, or the COVID is issues. Um, and I actually have a friend with a very similar condition. Uh, she has a, she has to wear up, she has a hole in her, her stomach. Oh, and yeah. She, like a catheter bag. I'll put you in touch because I'm trying to oh, persuade yeah. her. Uh, to give her exactly the same. There's uh, there's not too many not too many people knocking around with the old uh, the old stomach hole catheters. So uh, yeah, and she's got it. She has this, this this bag. She gives it a name, and uh, she's very <laughs> open about it. And she she runs a YouTube channel to help folks with the same condition. Oh, cool, so I'll put you guys in touch. But awesome. fantastic il il illustrations as well, and a fantastic use of color. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, and I, I hope, um, Brogan, if you, if you can sort of chuck the link into the, the YouTube, I'd, I'd really appreciate it um, as well. Um, but yeah, let's, let's keep going. So David, thank you so much uh, again. Um, and now we move back up north to Leeds, to Laura. Hello. Um, hello, hello. Right, give me two secs. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. So I think, again, it's all with the beauty of, sort of having David speak and Laura, we can sort of branch out slightly from Manchester. I don't know if we'll be able to do this in the physical realm when we get back, but um, speaking to people we admire in different parts of the country, I think, as you know, as the, uh, the love 24 hour Globe Marathon sort of showed, bringing loads of people doing interesting things together of this kind of virtual space is really cool. So really grateful to, to have Laura because she's been doing some really great things in, in Leeds, just a stone's throw away from Manchester, unless you're on the train, in which case it takes a really long time. <laughs> and not um, that train, it takes so long. <laughs> That's well, crazy. Uh, right, are you ready to go? I think I am. Are we ready? Okay. okay. Yep, go. Oh, um, uh, no you're not. You go, you go, you go. Am I okay? Okay. So just before we get into the, uh, into the um, presentation, I'd like everybody to have their phone ready because I need you to take a picture of a QR code. My name is Laura Wellington and my brain is a colourful place. I think about colour so much now that it feels like a friend. That's weird, isn't it? I am hypersensitive to colour, but I, I wasn't always as colourful personally. And when I say personally, I mean in myself. I mean, look at where I work. The building that you are seeing is a place which I co-founded with my partner in life and business, James. This is a building of two parts. Duke Studios, where we have 75 creative businesses and have a host of meeting rooms for hire, plus an outside yard and we call this the business side. And then we have Sheaf, Sheaf Street, which is the fun side. And we like to have fun, lots and lots of fun. Uh, we host all manner of things from talks like tonight to comedy, to conferences, to parties, to weddings. We designed, made and created every square inch of it ourselves. We often forget that it's totally not normal to work in a colourful bubble every day. Anyway, back to colour for me personally. This slide is a fine example of my colour doll. I was in so Stockholm on the phone to my brother and got totally distracted by the colour palettes in the store across the road. I literally couldn't wait to get him off the phone to take a picture. <laughs> this sounds quite bad when I say it out loud, uh, but it isn't unusual. I often lose track of chats looking at the surrounds of people. So I think by now you might have gathered, I think, a lot about colour, but tonight I'd like to talk to you about the confidence that colour has recently given me. I call this Laura BC, Laura before colour. I wasn't confident in myself, don't get me wrong, I was no wallflower. I went out and I had fun. I dropped in a little colour here and there, but I started my colour journey uh, at this point. We used to have a fun day in Duke, and I chose to uh, play with clay and mix colours, and that's kind of what kicked it all off. These really shit-looking bits truly were the start of my colour journey. 
I created color palettes and then made them in inverted commas into jewelry. I didn't do anything with these bits for a long time. And then six months later, enter stage right, Mr. Scruff. When he arrived, he was a dick. Every time I left the room, he screamed a lot. I cried a lot, but I used the enforced cabin puppy fever to get back to creating my own colors. I then started to post them onto Instagram and that's when it all kicked off. People went crazy for them. I couldn't keep up, but I also couldn't believe how many people wanted my work. People loved the colors, the patterns, the combinations. Each one was unique, so people would make a specific journey to buy more. I felt dizzy. And then as my side hustle grew, so did my confidence. I got more adventurous in my clothes and my hair color. <laughs> I smiled more. I was happy because my brain's, brain and hands were happy from making and creating more color. It was, as it was like I'd unlocked a part of my brain. The color obsession has always been there, but the confidence had not. And then in amongst all of this, we had some major stress. We found out that we were being evicted from our flat because of that stupid dog. Uh, it turns out that the, the landlord said yes, but the building said no. We'd lived there for 10 years. <laughs> we pushed it for as long as we could, hiding scruff in a bag to go in and out. And eventually, thankfully, we found a house. And so this was uh, the next part. I had, to whole, I had to paint a whole house, a whole house to choose a color palette for. I literally couldn't believe it. I could make all of the design, design decisions. I do commercial interior design as part of my practice, but this time there was no client to convince to be brave in color. It was at this point that I basically spent an afternoon with a bucket load of testers on the kitchen wall, which was going to be knocked down, stood back from it, and then I just let my eyes follow the colors um, around and just map the house. I'd never worked like this before. I let the colors make their own journey. And then I frantically ran from one room to the other, running about making tester squares to see if it worked. I chose the whole color palette for the house in just one afternoon. I worked out all the palettes as you would travel through the house from room to room, from floor to floor. And it was a pretty exciting process. One of the things that I had to remember in all of this though, was that I also live with my partner in life and business, James and he isn't as confident in color as I am. So I had to be mindful of him. If it was up to me, it would have been a house full of color and probably masses and amounts of geometric patterns. Um, so yeah, so the colors, because we spent all of our time together, the colors couldn't cause too many disputes. But there were some areas in the house where that they were mainly mine. So I was able to bring in bursts of color and pattern. I freestyle painted this mural in one of the hottest summer weeks with no plan. At one point that squiggle uh, created what I called Bauhaus Cockgate uh, and I had to very so slightly edit a little bit out of it <laughs> in the second run. So as my house got more colorful, I got more colorful. I went through many hair colors. My clothes got more colorful uh, and my confidence grew. And eventually uh, my hair went yellow, which is something that I had wanted to do for a really long time. So this is the point in the presentation where I need you to get your phone out and I need you to take a picture of this QR code. Um, I'm currently sat in my attic where I can now make up lots of colors. The QR code is a song which has become my anthem. I want you to listen to it after the presentation. The video is a bit distracting. Um, so just maybe close your eyes and listen to it um, uh, on the first run. So, our, our landlord at Chief Street loved what we were doing in the house. I think maybe he'd noticed my newfound confidence in colour. And he asked me if I would take on the inside of a new building, inside and outside of a new building he had just bought. In June 2019, we completed the graphics uh, of the exterior of Graphical House with Mr Penfold. Um, and then I went on after that to then start to bring more colour and joy to the rest of the city. Um, I approached another landlord and told him uh, that he needed to let me paint his boat and that he had to pay for it. And then now 1.5 years on, I spend a lot of my time bringing colour, joy and art to the streets of Leeds. And I now live my life in full Technicolor. My best friend soon assures me that one day I will become irresistible. Life goal. Colour truly does breed confidence. Uh, you can go and find links to all the things we do in our colourful world through the other this next QR code. I did Google, can I make a QR code kind of called colourful? But apparently you can't. <laughs> Laura, thank you so much. <laughs> wow, what a presentation, what a transformation, what fantastic hair you've got. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I'm not sure whether that's, uh, I'm not sure what uh, um, type of uh, um, uh, colour that is in the animal kingdom. I think it's a warning, isn't it? That? So we have to be <laughs> a little bit careful of, of you, yeah? I know. Then you blank. But um, no, it's fantastic. The colour is really transformative and um, it's really it's great that you're moving from inside to outside too now, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I think I think I'm up next, so it's a really good uh, se segue into my presentation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you for that. Um, it's really good. What What's happening with your bu boyfriend, husband? Is he getting into color a little bit more? Now? Is it <laughs> no, not really. I just really? did things like really sneakily. I also like had to set up in good company because we run a number of different companies, and I basically right. had to set up in good company and not actually tell him I was doing it. I just kind of started doing things. It's just that kind of like, what, this old thing, that building, yeah. Do you, think, do you think that COVID has helped you be more bold? Um, um, because, because I'm good friends with Morag, uh, Morag Myerscroft, who's, whose work's kind of changed uh, because of COVID and she's become more colourful and energetic and more graphic just because everybody's so depressed, you know? <laughs> well, I think that, um, I think maybe not personally, but I think the work that we've been doing within Good Company, we've done a massive project, well, two times, called Posters for the People, which is with Morag, obviously. And that has just been amazing. And um, in the first round, and we also, um, what it has made me realize is we just completed a 88 foot high Anthony Burrell uh, mural. Okay. And it made me realize just how much people really love big mural pieces, especially in this time. I think because we've been brought down to our minimal, like that got shared all around the world. Everyone went crazy for it. And um, yeah, it just to think like, I think lockdown has shown us how important color and creativity is because, and I think more people are getting more colorful in their houses and, and things as well. So got yeah. It, got it. Fantastic. Thank you very thank much. You. Oh, thank you, thank you. I think it's interesting, like in Manchester as well, as people can see, like there's murals everywhere. Um, you know, I think, I can't remember what it was called, maybe Cities of Colour, if I remember correctly, but someone who spoke at our second ever Petra Future back in 2017 about it. But yeah, it's, it's interesting, like, I think we've got, like, graffiti artists who sort of update the local, like, um, landscapes, kind of almost yeah. reflect. So we had, like, Arya Stark when it was Game of Thrones, and I think we've got Captain Tom more, more recently. And I think yeah, it's, it's actually really hard to make things happen in Leeds. Leeds is a funny city. It takes, it's very risk averse. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of convincing and you kind of need to like earn your stripes before you're then you've got lots of boring planners so how, how did you get that through that that big um, on that corner because that's that doesn't really fit within the planning guidelines I'm yeah. sure. and it's a grade two listed building and it took us a year to do it and um i think it was the penful piece that kind of showed because the first the also those two buildings are next to the civic trust which are the um custodians of the past present and future of the city and they hated the pen, well, I shouldn't say hate, they just liked the pen fold one at the beginning. And I can remember when I was in a meeting once and somebody said, our, our office is just by that big building. And then I was like, yes. So um, I think it's just showing people, I think people just need to be shown. It's a bit more kind of, yeah, uh, exactly. cautious. Very good. Thank you very much. So yeah, segue, segue. Mark, are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Hold on, I've got to change my color because I'm going from Pachakcha uh, Petra Kucha into my office uh, in colour, so I better go to, so yeah, I'm, a, I'm now my, my, my colourful background for this presentation. That's why I'm wearing black just to offset the colourful background. So, okay. uh, Mark signed up, is it well, this morning, yesterday, uh, I've lost track of time, but that, like sort of at the 11th hour, if I can speak, so I'm really, really grateful for you, for you jumping in, but it seems like it was <laughs> serendipitous, I think, um, exactly. what you're going to talk about. So I'm just going to share my screen again. Let's go. All right, are you ready to go? Good to go, yeah, thank you. Go. Okay, so I'm Mark Dytham. I'm, uh, the co I have a day job and a night job. Night job is running Protect Tonight. And the day job is uh, being an architect. I'm uh, uh, based in Tokyo now. I'm from Northamptonshire. And along with Astrid Klein, I run Klein Dytham Architecture over here. And colour is really, really important in, in our work. And I thought I'd show you a couple of projects. This is a police box in, in, uh, in Kumamoto in, in southern Japan. And it's all about colour. In fact, I think black and white are colours too. And this is a little bit of a joke on uh, the Japanese police car, which you can see there with the white top and the, and the black box, box bottom. And um, these police cobans are kind of 
um, information uh, stations are planted in cities so you can go and find an address or something and the local policeman is there. Uh, but they're always really sad and drab and we thought that we'd bring this color to the space. The upstairs room there, that little square box is where they actually have a rest. And so we've built this rainbow uh, environment for them so they can look out onto a really lovely uh, world. But we really like uh, the way that color can be introduced into the city. We also like the impact packs of black and white here and how our patterns uh, in interact with the road patterns that have been painted on the floor. So it's really graphical um, and really up uplifting. Um, so this is a project that we've opened today and, that's, uh, and it's all about color. It's all about an urban hotel in an incredible setting. You can see an expressway there with some very black and white graphic lines, which you'll see we like again, and a train line and the water is the imperial moat of Japan or an extension of it. And this is a hotel, this is a site for a new hotel, which as I say, open today, it's called Toggle Hotel. And we wanted to create uh, something really impactful, a billboard so the hotel advertised itself. It's on the main train line, as I said, that crosses across Tokyo, the Chuasen, which is yellow. So uh, you can see where we're picking our color up from. But Tokyo is really gray and monotonous. And so we, we introduced that gray. This was, uh, we, this was approved 18 months ago. Uh, so you can imagine our surprise when the color, the Pantone color of the year was gray and this absolute ye yellow, which is, was kind of amazing. But it's, it's an incredible hotel where the architects and the uh, interior diet designers. And we wanted to celebrate the vitality of the city the movement, the energy. And instead of at this really tight corner, put, putting the emergency staircase, we thought this would be the place uh, for, you know, the most expensive rooms with these fantastic views of the expressway. So when you come to Tokyo, this is the room you're gonna wanna stay in. And I'm sure lots of films and movies will be shot in these rooms. But as I say, we're really into color. We think hotels are really boring. You never know what floor you're gonna get, what you've got off on the right floor. You have to look at the number. Well, here we have uh, we have eight, eight different, colors. Each floor is a different color. Also, when you walk out your room, you'll know which way to go because, you, you know, whether you're going left or right in the blue. But here you go. Here's a few uh, examples of the other color. Uh, Astrid, my business partner, she's into colors. She does all the color choosing. I do the more architectural and the stru structural things. But I think she's, cut, she's ch chosen well here. They're really impactful. And um, it's been amazing with the test days that have been going on. People have all, it, it's an Instagrammable hotel but we extend the color into the rooms as well. And there's a two-tone color, there's a lighter color for the wet area, for the shower and the bathrooms, and then um, for the loft room. So this hotel, it's got high floor to floors. And uh, what we've done, it's, it's an economical hotel. You can, uh, th three people can stay in a room and we put this loft bed in uh, and that gets around the regulations. If we put a loft in, we go over, we go over floor area. So this is, this is regarded as furniture, which is placed in the space. And so you can actually work below here. It's, it's, it's a really uh, compact little room, extremely Japanese. And again, color, we thought, well, if you're only gonna be there for a couple of days, let's go for it. And uh, let's make the whole room green, the cushions, the bedding, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the whole thing. And um, you actually book your hotel. I just searched for Toggle Hotel and uh, it'll, it'll pop up on, um, on Google. So you can actually choose a room, not only through uh, the size of your room, but also through the color combination of your room. Um, there are 85 rooms, and with all the different color combinations and room sizes, there are 60 different types of rooms uh, which you can choose from. So depending on your color, whatever your husband likes, uh, you can uh, you can ch choose your room. And again, it's everybody loves it. And, and how about the laundry room? Why, do la why are laundry rooms in hotels so dire? They can be really fantastically bright and sunny like this one here, so we've used yellow there. The washing machines are behind us. We've got a big table there, which you can iron on uh, or sit and do your work. You can even have a workation in, in the laundry room. Then up on the top floor, which is the ninth floor, that's the cafe and the reception area. This, this is where you arrive. And it's a light, airy, green room uh, that you can see the whole of the city from. And again, this cut, cut color split is kind of funny. So the hotel's name is Toggle. And it's a, like a toggle switch. So you can either be on, you're working here for business or you're off uh, st staying here for leisure. And that was what's led, led to this uh, split in color. So you can be gray and boring and a sa salary man or uh, bright green and a gardener on the other um, side. 
And this floor also leads out onto uh, a green deck. Um, so in the heart of the city, you've got this o oasis on the top floor. Um, and as I say, it's been um, a real, real success. Um, what's been interesting is that anime and cosplay people have, have spotted this and all of those have favorite colors and, and they've got 500 bookings uh, from um, these, these types of folks. There's a, a Tokyo Dome is nearby and they've got a big event coming up. So all the cosplay people are staying here so they can take in, in Instagram photographs of themselves against the color uh, within the room. So it's a real in, in Instagram hotel. And here, another fantastic terrace, which looks down uh, the expressway. So rather than shying away from the city, we've really em embraced it. And, you know, it's really spectacular at night too, as you drive past and it's a really massive billboard for the hotel. So that's our, that's our take on color. I hope you enjoyed it. And please come and sweat when, when you're allowed, when they let you out of the UK, please come to Tokyo and stay at Toggle Hotel. Thank you. <laughs> wow, that was good. I've done that one. <laughs> so good. That together. That what, what, so good. This one, four hours ago, Kyle. <laughs> I was, I was actually looking at room rates. They're quite reasonable, actually. So I was thinking, yeah, well, there's lots of in, um, yeah, it's about a, it's about a hundred bucks a night right now. Can just we do a um, trip? <laughs> sorry. Can we do a Manchester Petra Kucha trip over there and stay there? I think you should. In fact, we're going to do our next uh, our next event in the cafe up there. So uh, on uh, April the twenty first. Um, so yeah, it's been it's real been a really fun fun project. It was funny. The um, so just the thing. Um, where have where have you uh, where have you gone, Laura? There you are. Um, so the, the planning for this is interesting because there's there, there, there's no visual guidelines in Japan. We can do anything we kind of want, but right. there is a kind of informal process. We have to go to uh, the local authority. There is there is a limit on the chroma we can have in the yellow, um, and so, so there are color guidelines, but there's no stylistic guidelines. So we could have done any pattern we wanted to on the on the on the building. So amazing! So and, uh, we, yeah. So we start, but we started off with uh, diagonal stripes, which were, which were inspired from the expressway. And so we got to the local authority, and we're talking to uh, the lady there, and she's going, "Yeah, but you know, um, yeah, I'm not so sure about that diagonal stripes because you know, you know, this is built right next to the imperial moat. Could you make it a bit more imperial looking?" Was <laughs> what she said. I'm like, "Dude, you've you've built the expressway." in the moat and you're telling us we've got to be a little bit more imperial so mm -hmm. we we took we, the the the, uh, the stripes we came more but, but vertical but there's no planning approval we have to go through it's, it's, it's crazy kind of can i ask a question about the building did you purposely play with the holes and the shadows on the floor as well in the first was that uh, the was that a purposeful absolutely yeah, yeah. i mean that's the whole yeah the whole yeah. Of game. That's but it, but it's, it's been amazing because in, in Japan right now, we're still in semi lockdown, which means, you know, we, uh, bar, bars and things close at nine o'clock. Tokyo has been, it's been, you know, we've, we've been very lucky here. And I think that's to do with the fact that, you know, uh, we, you know, we don't hug and kiss one another. We, we sort of bow and, and everybody's used to wearing face masks. And so uh, it's been kind of light. So the city's been t ticking away, but the big hotels have really struggled. Mm -hmm. But to see this hotel go through the roof in terms of people wanting to stay there uh, has been really interesting. So the power of color again. I want to go and stay there. Yeah. I was wondering when you're in a green room, my hair goes like, it would be funny to see what color my hair goes in each room. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's um, it's. Uh, I've stayed there three nights now in different rooms, and um, first of all, it's not very noisy. Um, we've got double glazed glass, but we've got sound. The most important thing is not the glass; is actually the cladding system. You need a cl soundproof, isolated cladding system, and that stops the sound from the trains and the cars c c coming in. Um, but the rooms are really comfortable. It's nowhere near as o o overpowering as you think it would be, and I think that's because you're sitting in the color area, looking really towards the lighter. T tiled area, so the combination seems to work really well. That's really cool. Um, also, also interesting is the, the, the colour scheme you've got surrounding the hotel matches the colour scheme for the Metrolink in Manchester as well. So if, <laughs> if there's something like we sort of get a picture, it's the same one. So it's like, it's really weirdly like connecting that in that way. Um, yeah. yeah, and it was really odd, this Pantone colour of the year thing, because it's exactly the, the great, if you, you go to so Google Pantone colour of the year, and you'll just see, and it's two colours this this year, the first time they've ever given two colours, and it's this light grey, 
and this vibrant yellow, but it's that kind of slightly pale y yellow, a little bit like Vanessa's uh, shirt, you know. Uh, so it's not quite as bright as Laura's hair. <laughs> so it sits in between. Anyway. I'd love to see a hospital uh, ward decked out like that. So that would really cheer people up, wouldn't it? I know. She Get us in. We're happy. <laughs> I love how it went straight That's down out. the middle with the colour. Yes. That line straight down. That was like, wow. <laughs> no, it's... Um, yeah, no, it is, it's quite dynamic when, when you walk in. So, and everybody gets a camera out instantly, which is exactly what we want, you know. So, very good. I'm going to share my screen again. So give me a sec. Uh, just to show the fact that there's a bit of a break. So, we're going to have a 10 minute break. Uh, but before you scoot off, I'm just going to point you to Jada's uh, video. So, again, Boring for what Laura said before, get your phones out because we've got a QR code for this as well so you can sort of take a shot as well. We'll put the YouTube link into the chat as well for anyone else. But uh, Jade has made a video for us. So one of the things we really like to do is kind of connect with the local uh, design community and sort of say, look, we've got space and a platform to showcase your work. So uh, Jade has made this uh, video for us. I will be playing it out, but if anyone's watches a video played out on Zoom, sometimes it can go a bit uh, wacky. So let's see what happens. Um, so that'll happen happen in a couple of seconds. Um, but yeah, just take an opportunity to grab uh, Jada's details uh, and follow her. I'm going to turn Jada. Do you want to sort of say a few words in, as an intro? Because you're here. Hello. Hi. Um, so yeah, sorry about the cheesy um, back to school photo. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I just made a short film. Thanks Lovish for um, getting me involved. Um, kind of took it upon myself just to do something different. So it's my first film. Hope you guys like it. It's about uh, celebrating diversity and trying to express yourselves and being authentically you. Thank you for that. Uh, and yeah, if you get a chance, look at uh, watch Jada's uh, Petrovich talk from Migration. So that's on our, uh, it's on YouTube as well. Uh, so that's a QR code. I'll give you a few seconds to uh, grab that. Uh, but yeah, uh, we'll come back. Um, I'd say about quarter past. Uh, nine. So we'll restart nine. Forgive me. Quarter past eight. Can't do my time. So eight fifteen. We will be back. Um, so please depart, but do come back, um, and I will move on to press play. Wish me luck with this.
So it's got uh, for about a minute and a half before we come back. But yeah, I hope everyone got a chance to watch Jada's video in that gap. Um, yeah. So, Mark, with the hotel, you said there was like five, what, how many people signed up already? Oh, you're on mute, you're on mute. Yeah, it was kind of nuts. It's gone, it's gone mad on Twitter. And one anime cosplay person started tweeting around it and it got, it's got 21,000 uh, uh, likes and 4,000 retweets by one person and then it sort of spread on. Um, and then it went on, then it got on Dizine y yesterday and they were getting a booking a minute uh, wow. for the first two, for a couple of hours. They got a hundred bookings in a couple of hours. And so it's kind of, so they're kind of like, wow. <laughs> I think we're gonna do a chain of Coca-Cola hotels was, was the comment, you know? So it's, especially in lockdown, um, it's been interesting, yeah, so. And of course we've got, so the hotel was meant to be built. So it was meant to open for Tokyo Olympics. So as we got cl clearer, closer to it and we realized that it wasn't gonna happen, everything sort of slowed down and, and it's been mothballed really for six months. And we were due to open at the beginning. So we, we, we came out of a peak and we were about to, about to launch again, beginning of the year. And then we had another st state of emergency. So we decided, they decided to, to hold again. And so we came out of the last state of emergency about three weeks ago. And uh, so everybody sc scrambled uh, to, to launch the hotel on 1st of April, no April Fools, but um, it was uh, so open to open to, uh, well, yesterday here now, anyway. So it's good, it's good, it's been good. They're very happy and um, the power of color. Yeah. <laughs> so it's amazing to link in with your event tonight. So I thought I'd better get up. Um, it's now quarter past four here. <laughs> so, <laughs> but tomorrow, I'm taking tomorrow off because of you guys. So um, I'll get a bit of sleep later. But it's been really, really fascinating first half. Thank you all so much. You know, really, really amazing, amazingly colorful presentations and, 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 in, and moving and inspiring. And the video was fantastic too. Um, so I managed to see it one, one time through there. Thank you very much. Well, I will. Yeah, relaunch by saying thank you to, to Jada for, for doing that. Uh, I say just take a moment there so you can grab her uh, her Instagram handle so you can follow her there as well. And I think we've posted the, the link in the chat as well so you can rewatch it again. So, uh, Emma, are you here? Hello. Hi, hi, hi. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Emma's done some really interesting projects with sort of uh, organizations which. Uh, I love and admire, so it'd be great to hear some more about that. But yeah, uh, let me know when you're good to go and I'll press. Enter. Yeah, no, I'm all good. Go. Okay, so I thought I'd start like right back at the beginning. So um, I'm an artist and a designer. I'm originally from Bury, but I've grown up and lived around various different towns in Lancashire. So here's a picture of me when I was younger. And as you can see from the dungarees, I've always been a fan of color. Um, and I do still get that excited about ice cream. <laughs> Um, so my studio practice, You Good Studio, uh, it explores the use of colour and composition to create vibrant abstract work. And um, that's primarily through printmaking, painting and murals. So I use like blocks of colour and patterns, which has created kind of like a style which has been present throughout my practice. So it wasn't until I was 24 that I decided to study art. Um, I remember being at the Tate. Um, this sounds super cliche, but I was at the Tate and I remember seeing The Snail by Henry Matisse. And to me, this was like the perfect example of the power of colour. It was so vibrant and it had so much energy in it. And it just, it, it amazed me how lively it was. Um, and it made me think, yeah, I want to be an artist. So I went to study fine art at Blackburn. Um, and these three years were really like important to me as a person. Um, and I met really incredible people there. Um, and yeah, I kind of like tried and tested everything. And I know that I'm not a performance artist. I'm too awkward for that. Um, but I started off quite figurative and then slowly over time, my work became more and more abstract. One thing that was consistent, however, was color. It was something I was always drawn to and what inspired me to create work. I really kind of like the idea of uh, color and energy together. And um, so when combining bright colors and abstracted forms, I kind of envision it to have like a vibrant energy. Like I can almost imagine how the shapes would kind of interact with each other. 
I always listen to music when I'm creating work. And I think that kind of influences the kind of shapes that I use and the colors that I choose. And um, for me, color is a powerful tool of communication. And I found that the more abstract that I went, the more um, kind of expressive I was within my work. It was kind of like, um, like a secret language, like I could create this meaningful work, but also retain some kind of mystery, which um, I really like that idea. So I found that um, when, so I found that through making, um, I became more uplifted and more energized. This was something that became more and more clear to me. Color brings joy. It made me happy being around it and it uplifted my mood. I think that was why I was especially excited to start painting murals. I started to think, how can these bright pieces change space? So Kandinsky said, color is a power which directly influences the soul. And that kind of really hit home with me. So bringing, being around color, that made me feel good. So does it make others feel good? What colors evoke a reaction and an emotion? The idea of creating work in public spaces is really exciting to me. You look across like this natural landscape and then bam, you have this bright piece of work interacting with the normal every day. And it's kind of like a form of escapism, like an injection of color into like that normal landscape. Um, and the idea of do people change how they are in that like area then? Do they change how they feel? So moving forward to 2020, and you all know what that means, because of COVID-19, like many, I started working from home. And when you don't have the normality of everyday life, you can take a step back and slow down and start thinking. And that's what I did. I started to think a lot and thinking about my practice. I live in a very small town, um, and like a lot of small towns around here, and especially with Northern weather, it's, the, it's a very kind of neutral and gray color palette. I mean, I do love where I live, don't get me wrong, but there's lots of browns and greens and I really started craving colour. Um, I began looking out and around at how colour can be injected into like the everyday life and thinking about this effect it has on the local population. And I started thinking about like how adding colour to that landscape, what value can that give? So I was looking out at different examples such as like Miami Beach, they have these really vibrant beach huts along the coast and they're absolutely incredible. And that very vibrant, bright, crashing, clashing colors um, has become like really vital in part of the landscape and a small town in India as well. They're their homes and they choose the colors um, and it's like an expression of themselves. And again, so out of the natural landscape, but so joyful. So as I couldn't start going out and painting in all these places that I wanted to paint. I started like reimagining places with my work on it and thinking about kind of like dream projects and adding color into local places, city landscapes and architecture that I loved. I liked imagining how my work could change these spaces and with it being digitally done, it allowed me the room to be quite experimental with what worked and what didn't. And I had time to play around with different kind of compositions and be a bit bolder with my work, I think. Um, so yeah, I, at the time I started thinking about You Good Studio and why that was important um, of work to come out of lockdown. This was created with the idea that colour can spread joy and how can artwork have a positive message. I really wanted to encourage healthy and positive conversations about mental health and wellbeing especially after the nightmare of a year that we've been through. So I like the idea of this work being in unexpected places and on a large scale, whether that's in size or quantity, like, could that be me painting, I don't know, like um, city walkways and street lamps and stuff like that. But the idea of kind of injecting this color into like a rural landscape, I found really interesting. Like, would people appreciate the pop of color or not? So the idea of creating my work that may have a positive effect on someone's health is something that really drives my work and makes me want to create. I like the idea that a piece of work because of the color can make somebody smile. So whether that is a print on the wall or someone walking down the street and they'll see a mural, like if that makes somebody happy, then I think it's worth it. And I just think that color and art is a really powerful tool and can have such a wonderful effect on someone's mental health. Um, and yeah, that's it really, thank you. <laughs> Great, Emma. 
Mm. That was really, uh, really, lots of really great uh, things sort of coming out uh, of all these yeah. presentations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but I thought what was really interesting was we're talking about talking about weather and its impact on color. Yeah. So um, although ca California is is a beautiful place, I don't know the colors pop, but they do pop because it's nice and sunny. But everything else is nice there. Uh, but I think that in, in and that gray, uh, those gray English foggy mornings um, uh, or those rainy, those rainy days, I think this injection of color, especially into the northern towns would, would be really interesting. And I thought your, your color sense was, was fantastic. And I love those overlays uh, just on that, that sort of uh, the, the countryside slide with the colors there. I just imagined that you'd made these billboards and there were these lumps of color that were scattered around. Yeah, so, uh, really, really great. We, we seem to accept advertising and we, you know, but we don't seem to accept color as, 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 as well. Yeah, we, we, I guess we're all, uh, we, 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 we don't see um, advertising really. It's also, it's just there, but not present. <clears throat> when people seem to be so afraid of color, it's, it's a shame, yeah. Yeah, I think but, yeah. So those were all mock-ups, were they? They look very real. No, not all of them. Like some of them have been done, but whilst I was in lockdown because I couldn't go out into these places, I went more right. digitally. So, like, sadly, I haven't paid on like those grand architectural buildings. <laughs> Maybe those one brutal, day. Well, but... of those brutal buildings uh, in Sheffield and Manchester could do with a could do with a bit of a, of cut colour from from you. So, well, if anyone you. Know, have you come across Chantelle Martin? If you come across Chantel Martin, she's based, she used to be in Tokyo and uh, we helped her kick off her career at Super Deluxe where Pachacha Night started. She's now a big famous artist in New York, but you oh. should look her up. It's, there are some similarities with your work. Chantel Martin, it's fantastic. Oh. Anyway, Emma, thank you very much. Cheers. Sure if you can do anything in Bolton, where I'm from. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all right. Uh, gray northern towns um but yeah so just one thing you, you mentioned about mental health which reminded me uh rachel and jordan you've got design recovery coming up do you want to just give a quick shout out to that event yeah so yeah, i forgot 100%. to do it in the the start the shout outs at the start but next thursday so a week from today um it's our second online design recovery event hopefully, hopefully it'll last yeah hopefully the last <laughs> we miss everyone but um yeah it's basically just a safe space for everyone to talk um, openly if they want to about mental health. Um, we started it mostly in the creative industries just because that's where our kind of network is, but we mm. expand it um, a lot. And we've got some amazing speakers. We've got a woman who um, started a project where she had dealt with bereavement from suicide. Um, and she started a project in Manchester where she got um, a community of other people that had been through um bereavement from suicide and they've come up with this big quilt that's got like everyone involved um and we've got like uh founders of design agencies and other creators Carl, Carl, a previous petra yeah another petra um <laughs> so yeah around. that's next thursday i think there's still some tickets yeah there's still, there's still a few tickets left um and but yeah i think we've just announced yeah we've announced last speaker today and yeah a few more tickets left to go the but... instagram is at Design recovery. Design recovery. So the link to the events, the tickets and stuff, <laughs> it's all free. There's an optional donation to Mind Charity, but we want to keep all the events free as much as we can. So, mm. yeah. I, I this is an on, 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 online event, or is yeah, this will be this will be an online event. Yeah. Awesome. I'll check, I'll check it out. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, yeah, Kyle. You, we'll put a link in the chat now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Put in the chat and uh, broken all connect the dots. Right. Thank, Thank you. No worries. No worries. Um, Glad I remembered. Um, so yeah, thank you Emma for uh, reminding me. Um, right, Annalise, are you ready? Oof, yeah, I think so. I don't think you can in the background, but my, my neighbours are singing very, very badly um, next next door. I think they're probably breaking some COVID restrictions there, so I, I apologise for any distractions. Um, but yeah, are you good to go? Yeah, I'm good to go. Cool. So... Tonight, I'm gonna to talk to you about how important color is for shaping our world and guiding us. But color is actually something we've completely made up. Yep, it's true, it really doesn't exist. So I'm Annalise Lewis, 
and as well as being co-founder of a Manchester-based company called Pentameter, I'm also a colour psychologist and brand strategist. And one of the things that I find absolutely fascinating is how we understand and engage with the world around us. So colour only exists in our minds, but light is what exists outside of us, all different wavelengths exactly what Richard was explaining earlier. But what we do is perceive this light and then reinterpret it as color by our brains, but not in one specific region of the brain in particular. There's no actual one home for where color exists. So context really is everything. We've evolved with our environment to see color around 30 million years ago due to needing to perceive predators or identify foods like bright red berries in the forest, all in order to survive really. And having done it for so long, this ability to see color is now one of the simplest things our brain does. I mean, we learn to read color before we actually learn to read words. At 18 months, a child can recognize color, but can't name it until about 36 months. So I know I'm saying that colours don't exist, but some colours really, really don't exist, like magenta, for instance. With magenta, we've actually evolved some real trickery with our minds. Uh, in the light spectrum, there isn't actually any wavelength of colour that corresponds with the colour magenta, with ultraviolet on one end and infrared on the other. So where is colour coming from? Where is magenta coming from? It's simply a construct by our brain mixing the blue and red light simultaneously. And this isn't the only time we've mixed up red and blue. The genderization of color only appeared around the mid 19th century. Back then mothers were told that for their boys to grow up strong and manly, they should be dressed in masculine colors, you know, like pink uh, and pink only started being marketed as the perfect color for women after the Second World War. And blue suddenly became masculine. And this divide has only become bigger and bigger over time. But how we're conditioned to understand color not only changes over time, but also over location. Our culture and our location also affects how we read color. So, depending on where we're from and where we grow up, we will attribute different meanings and symbolism. So I think it's fair to say that a fair amount of people here today watching will naturally have a Western bias to colour meaning. But did you know that while in the UK we see weddings as being white for their purity and their virtue, over in China traditionally weddings are associated with the colour red, a powerful symbol of success, loyalty and fertility. With globalization, however, these meanings are often blurred. But when we look at each culture and their individual language system of color, we also see more subtle changes in meaning depending on the tonal qualities of a hue. As a color psychologist, I've learned about the importance of undertone in conveying meaning uh, and also in creating harmony. This part uh, isn't really a science, but a figurative way to identify tonal qualities that are not that obvious, as you can see in the different types of blondes here. But undertones are the key to making sure that your color palettes are harmonious or what can trigger them to be jarring. Colors with a warm undertone have yellow qualities to them, like uh, turquoise or teal kind of in the case of blue, whereas cool colors have blue or red base uh, and more like your traditional navy or baby blue. But when we consider the messaging of these more subtle qualities, we start to play with the meaning and the story that we associate with that object or brand. Or it could be the other way around where the narrative that unfolds is symbolically captured in color. Does anyone remember the original forest green of Body Shop, which after L'Oreal bought them, the green turned so dark, it basically became black. This captured the distrust uh, that some people felt about L'Oreal's record, 
and who had chosen the body shop originally for their pioneering values and ethics. Sometimes, uh, though, it's hard to notice color changes. The, look at these two uh, squares. These grays are the same. But in simultaneous contrast, the phenomenon where color changes merely by what we put next to them, they begin to look a bit different. Uh, when surrounded by pink, the gray starts to look greenish. And when surrounded by green, it looks pinkish. This is because uh, evolution decided it was far more important to distinguish between a lion in the savannah uh, than to appreciate two identical yellows. So when we study and deconstruct color, it's hard to separate our cultural conditioning from our physiology as they really do work together as a system. We are unbelievably advanced while simultaneously completely fickle creatures. We continuously construct our reality while interacting with the world around us. In some examples that are obvious, like panicking at a red stop sign, uh, or others where we are making stuff up, like the gap in the matrix when we invent magenta whose existence really is just a pigment of our imagination. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Nice end there. Very good. <laughs> that had to come in somewhere tonight. So thank you. That was a really another fascinating uh, presentation. I'm sure you, you and Richard should get together, I think, and have a, have a quick colored conversation. Yeah, yeah it, ahead, is about, it is interesting, isn't it, about um, uh, how cult culturally we see colors in a different way. And um, mm. I thought that's an uh, explanation about ch Chinese weddings, which I've been to a few of where, where the bride does wear red, you know, and we're used to uh, brides wearing uh, white. And, and I also thought it was interesting that, you know, in the UK, if you get, um, I haven't been there for, well, I, have, I do go back <laughs> two or three times a year normally, um, but conservatives are seen as blue, aren't, aren't they? And labor seen as red. That's, that's right, yeah, that's generally, where, yeah. where you are, whereas in whereas in America, conservatives or Republicans are red, yeah, the red mag magma hat and stuff, you know, and the liberals and the Democrats are, are blue, which is kind of really weird. Um, so that it's, it's the opposite way around. I'm not. Um, so I was very interested in in what, what you were talking about there, and also this notion that that the boys wore wore pink. I'm gonna have to look look into that. That's very interesting yeah. how that. That, 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 that yeah, so it was only around the mid 19th century that that appeared. Before then, it was actually kind of not a thing at all. Kind of kids were dressed in white regardless. I think it's because right. uh, uh, it was easier to just bleach the uh, the fabrics kind of clean, kind of when they were kind of rolling about in the mud, really, I think. But so uh, it's not <laughs> fully known as to why it sw swapped after the Second World War. Kind of it just started to appear, but there's some theories out there. Um, well, it's a little bit different, but it's a little bit like how Chris Christmas became red and white because mm -hmm. of the Coca-Cola Father Christmas ad or Father Christmas appeared yeah. because of nine, before 1930, Christmas had no relation to red and white. Yeah. So yeah. It was kind of, it's kind of interesting, but really lovely presentation. Thank you so much. Brilliant. You, yeah, you win pun of the evening so far. I can't take all credit. I stole it off Stephen Fry circa 2015. Right, okay, Wendy, are you good to go? Yes, I think so. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. Um, oh. Hi, Wendy. So, oh, your head, I think your head's blocking, but we've got the same artwork. Oh, yeah. We talk about there we go. Uh, all right. Uh, which is your work, anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> obviously. Uh, we shall talk about a bit more now. So, if you're ready, Scott, I'll press go. Yeah. Cool. Go for it. So, um, this will just be a talk about me basically finding my journey, like finding my style. Um, as any Asian kid, um, Growing up, I was really into anime and cute things and cartoons, and they were my first real exposure to any like bold color um, and graphic communication. I really love Hello Kitty and Pokemon and Simpsons, which you can see. Um, 
but I think The Simpsons was probably the most impactful, the really bold colours, the bold lines. Um, I used, I really wanted to be a cartoonist, so I kept practising the characters, but I didn't have the skills to, to actually do that. Um, I did want to become an artist, but my mum really wasn't keen on it, bit of a tiger mum when I was a kid. Um, so I dropped that idea. Um, it seems a bit silly now as a child to have kind of given up on my dream so quickly, but if you grew up in an ethnic household, you probably listen to your parents a lot more. Um, so then I went to school, obviously. I concentrated on school, um, did art, but like I gave up drawing for fun entirely. Became interested in fashion and textiles um, because I thought it would help me flex my creativity a bit and hopefully make me some money because the retail sector is fairly big. So I went to uni, uh, went through the motions, did a foundation degree as well before that, um, and realized that fashion takes itself really seriously and my creative work became really too serious as well. I kept trying to emulate other people uh, rather than developing my own style, trying to find some commerciality. Um, so all the color drained from my work. It was pretty much devoid. I was always trying to be delicate or fine or some form of something, um, always trying to live up to something else. And I didn't really question why, I just kind of kept going with that because I was always chasing positive feedback. Um, so for my last practical project, I did a lot of dot work. Um, it, was an, it was supposed to be a textiles project, but I just focused a lot on illustration because I thought, I really like drawing, let's just follow this. And I found, thought I'd found my niche. Um, my uni tutor said it was the best work so far, which really lifted my confidence. But after uni, I had to go back to working at retail. Um, after applying for jobs in fashion and realizing it's an absolute hellhole, um, I decided to go into illustration. Um, long hours and soul crushing work was bleeding energy out of me and also really affected my mental health. So I used drawing as a therapy um, and it was really cathartic to be able to get things out on paper, but it wasn't what I deemed as good drawing. As you can see here, like I'm like hiding and being all moody. So I went back into the dot work, um, which will be on yeah, the, the next slide. But it always felt really try hard. It didn't feel very natural to me to be able to bosh these works out. I'd sit there with references or some sort of general idea but it just didn't flow very naturally out of me and I ended up feeling a bit of a failure because I couldn't keep up with the amount of work other people were pushing out and I just feel like I couldn't keep up so I decided to kind of give up in a way um, it wasn't really fun anymore and I'd gotten a full-time job in an office but with a job that had loads of traveling so it, drawing in a sense became a hobby um, and it's something that I used to doodle to pass the time, like when I was a kid, essentially. Um, so I started bringing my sketchbook with me on the train or on a plane. And it started with a black liner and then it started with the colored pencils and the markers. And I started trying to be a bit more humorous and just getting those feelings out again when I just felt a bit anxious or sad or just wanted to be a bit stupid. And it really referenced some of the work that I liked when I was growing up. So this is Yoshu Tomo Nara's work as a Japanese artist. Um, and a lot of his work doesn't have that much point to it, but it has a really clear style, really graphic. He uses a lot of pencils and it's just doesn't need to have a purpose. So that's why I wanted to follow that more in some of the work that I was developing. So this is some of the doodles that I was doing. It was like some of the chat up lines I got from Tinder. Um, so I just wanted to have, inject some humor into it. If, it. if it was something that was gonna be sad, if it was gonna be something that was fun, I just wanted to get it down and rather than worry so much compositionally about what it was gonna be like. Um, and then I started coming up with stuff like this, um, which had a lot more humor in it. I called it the P series. Um, but it, <laughs> because every, every word is, begins with P. Um, but it was the first time I started colouring in my work and it was when I started to feel more satisfied with what was churning out. This photo is when I was probably a bit more pivotal, pivotal on um, when I was getting more concrete with what my visual style was and what my illustration was. So a little bit more of that depressive moment that I wanted to get out there. And then, so this is one of the challenges that I did very early on 
It's called 36 Days of Soft Type. Um, obviously, this is just the alphabet, but it was like all the letters and numbers. And I was doing these, churning these out every day, drawing on an iPad and doing a few in a few days to catch up when I was really busy with work. Um, but it helped me find my style and my color palette really quickly. And that helped me find work, which this is the first paid job that I got, which was with uh, Women in Print in Manchester. And it was a really lovely project because it helped, the former project helped me get more exposure. And from then everything's kind of snowballed, like this project here where I got to work with Creative Boom and do the banners for their socials. Um, every one of those has led me to work with some people I really admire and it's it's been a really lovely journey over the years that, and I feel like the colours really helped me with that. It's still really challenging for me to break out of my mould, but when it does work, it's really satisfying. And I think as advice, the biggest thing I would say is to trust your instincts and to anybody who's trying to find themselves right now, just keep on going and trust your child. <laughs> Wow, Wendy, that's fantastic. Yeah. Oh my God, love it. <laughs> Thank you for being so open and showing all that, you know, that, that progression was really, really marvelous. And um, I can really relate to some of that. And I saw some, some, some um, comments in the, in the chat to yeah, say so how other people yeah. could relate with that. I certainly know my son, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's very, very, very artistic and trying to get him off, the, he gets anxious, he's on the iPad and there's just too much stuff around it. And, and if you can get him to sit down and draw, he just gets so into it and nothing else matters, you know. Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's a real therapy in, in, in a way, drawing and sketching. But I also loved how your colour had changed. And I thought your last slide was so, so, such a, such a, set, a set of sophisticated colours. Uh, with those muted tones and then a bit of bright, that was very ele elegant indeed. So uh, keep going and uh, please give us another another presentation in a couple of months with, with some more work. It was really brilliant. And very inspiring, so very important. uplifting. So Thank important you. to talk about those early steps. Mm. Like we don't see it enough. And I just remember when I was trying to develop my typography, I knew I loved it, but I just remember like it not feeling right for so long and I'd drop it and then I'd go back to it and then I'd drop it and I'd go back to it. Right. It's, it's something that I think is really important that we actually talk about because until you actually get to a point where you kind of feel comfortable with your style and it feels like you, that journey beforehand is so hard, like mentally. I think it's good to talk about it as well because I think, I think we've, we've sort of said this for many years now. And I think especially in the design industry, not a lot of the bigger designers really talk about those early stages. So you automatically think that they're just automatically just born amazing, perfect the way born they perfect. do they stuff. They don't have to struggle or anything. And then when you struggle, you think, oh, I'm doing it wrong. So it's really refreshing to see, you know, another yep. person coming out and speaking about that, really. Mm, thank you. <laughs> cool. And I think we've talked about doing kind of events around. I think we were, when we chatted to Karma Mason, he's a uh, designer around Manchester, about it's like all these projects which kind of get thrown by the wayside. Mm. And it's like, it'd be really cool just to kind of revive some of these and do a talk about the things that might have been if that project had gone to its natural conclusion. So I kind of keep that thought there if it might be something we can resurrect as a theme uh, for a later event. Yeah, okay. There's quite, there's quite a few, if you um, do sketchbooks and things like that, searching for chapter, there's people just go through through their sketchbooks, you know, for, tw for tw 20 slides, you know, it's a really, really easy for chapter to put on there. Yeah? Um, I'm trying to find my son's presentation. I'm going to put it in the in the uh, in the in the chat box. Um, anyway, fantastic! Really lovely to see that. All right, uh, we're on to our final speaker, uh, Jed. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to share the slides again. Um, but yeah, Jed got in touch uh, with us to speak ages ago. It feels like we finally yeah, made it. Time. Like. I think like power of color, will it fit? And then it's sort of like obviously blue. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't want to spoil anything, but it's yeah. it's a fantastic project. So obviously very, very um, of the time. So uh, thank you so much for for speaking tonight. Um, are, are you ready to close out proceedings? I'm, I'm ready to go. Ready to go. Yeah. Cool. All right, go for it. So I'm going to start with the color blue. Um, apparently, it's the world's favorite color. I don't know whether it's to do with the so power of the ocean or the optimism of a blue sky. 
Um, but the NHS chose it as their sort of corporate cover in 1980, I think, because it's all about stability, um, inspiration, wisdom, and health. And, and my name is Jack Cowes. I'm an architect principal. I work for BDP. And amongst many other things, we design fantastic hospitals that are very much not like the hospitals that Vanessa talked about in the first um, presentation. Um, they're about buildings that really care for patients, for the, their families, for the staff that, 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 that are within them. Um, and this, uh, there's a few projects I'm going to talk about that really kind of bring home this sort of fact that we use colour in a very creative way in those projects. This is Alder Hay, it's a children's hospital in Liverpool. And it was all about landscape connection and colour related to landscape. And we use art quite a lot in those references. So this is a plan of a typical ward. And we separated the ward out into different sort of homes um, delineate, delineated by those separate colours, culminating in the green at the end of the plan where the children have access out onto open play decks viewing the park beyond. And that you can see is the corridor that links to the play deck kind of at the end of, the, of, of that space. The other colour that was important for the project was red. Um, Liverpool, not just about the football, is founded upon the red sandstone geology. So we designed elevations that were about that material. But it was a very kind of rational plan. And any of the technical bits that couldn't fit into the plan pushed out of the building. And we created these things called the jewels, which are like crystalline kind of accretions from the kind of ruby through to the sapphire through to the emerald. And within the building, we use colour really carefully and thoughtfully. So this is the critical care part of the hospital. And they're normally in the depths of a building. But we flooded the space with daylight. We use yellow because it's a very optimistic colour. And we wanted the, the, the patients, families to really kind of have that hope and, and inspiration within the space. A couple of miles down the road, we were also asked to design a cancer centre called the Clatterbridge Cancer Centre, which was originally across the Mersey, in the Wirral, on the Green Belt, and enjoyed fantastic landscape setting and all the colours that that brought. But we had the challenge of bringing that to, to, to reality in a very urban site. And we used colour very sort of intelligently through the section of the building, that's a, a slice cut through the building. So we had yellow at the bottom for radiotherapy, optimistic colour, we had green, all about health and refreshing um, sort of spaces in our patients. And as you come into the building, you know, everybody loves a wood. Now, I think people in Japan are starting to do forest bathing, walking through forests to help their kind of health, you know, health and well-being. So we created a woodland setting for that main entrance. And so as you walk into the main entrance and you look up, you can see the daylight kind of flooding down into the space with the greens that we've kind of enveloped the space using acoustic paneling. Um, and that really is, is the essence of making sure our buildings are, are all about health, well-being, and really looking after the, the individual. We use art um, across all of our projects. So this, this, is a prep, this is a step sketch that was done on the left by the resident artist, um, it's a bit like the Channel 4 kind of advert. So you can see lift from one end of the outpatient space. Um, and again, lift, the word is all about kind of renewal and, and regeneration. Now, about a year ago, kind of this week, I got a call to say that we really needed to help the NHS cope with uh, the pandemic. The health system in the country was in danger of getting swamped. And, and not really coping and not having enough critical care beds. And we were given the challenge to transform the GMEX, which was a train station, is now an exhibition center, in a fully working, into a fully working hospital in 13 days, um, which was just a mind blowing sort of challenge um, that we took on with, um, with um, enthusiasm. There were a lot of stand up meetings. There was a lot of collaboration across the construction industry in the country. Now, the, the colour khaki apparently is, is from a Hindu word, it's about soil. Now, the colour khaki for me was about the army because they were enthusiastic, they were mentoring, they really supported us in, in our task. And they told us, forget about the minor details, think about pulling the big levers. 
there was a lot of red pen drawing um, and hand drawing as the, the, the schemes came together. It was quite a hard task. We probably had 13 days working 16, 17 hour days with almost a thousand people on the site. And we used the color in the plan as it developed to define usages and utilities and, and space sort of allocation within the plan. But also we defined sort of acuity and illness. So the, so the green were the staff, blue was all of the, um, the, 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 the sort of the, 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 the clean elements that needed to come into the building. We also realized that the staff were gonna be trained really quickly. So we used color to delineate on the, on the ward sort of bay annotation where where owners could go and wash their hands in the blue or can go and use the, the bin in the green. So we created um, 750 beds in 13 days with a thousand people, which was an amazing sort of um, challenge, but amazing achievement. Um, I actually contracted COVID and was in hospital at the beginning of the year. So I know the kind of frightening kind of experience that those patients that were in the hospital went through. But I come back to the NHS Pantone 300 optimistic blue, which all of these fantastic sort of um, staff and NHS people are, are proudly wearing and, and looks after the patients in that hospital so well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a really another incredible uh, presentation. Yeah, well, fantastic. I never thought about the NHS colour before. No, I know it's Pantone through 300. Yeah, yeah. And that's interesting, isn't it? But the sky and, 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 and the sea and um, how calming it is, or reassure. It's a re really reassuring colour. Yeah. I, 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 I did some I did some research into it just to find out if there was any kind of science to it, but I couldn't I, I couldn't find I couldn't find it. But I'm pretty sure that that that. that sort of psychological sort of content had been thought about when that when that color was chosen, I think. I mean, yeah, at least might, might, might know a little bit more about that. I mean, we talked all through all the presentations today about color is confidence and, and it unites, it's uniting and it's powerful. Uh, but I think this notion of it being uh, important, uh, a part of well-being is, is incredible. And I, I think that's, that's an important thing for us all go going forward post COVID or, or uh, dealing with COVID. I think we better say, I don't think it's ever going to be post COVID at the moment. But um, so, this notion of well being and how important co color is, it's very subliminal, really, how co color affects you. And I thought your, you know, your, uh, your hotel, uh, well, your, your hospital project, sorry, it's four in the morning here, man, I'm struggling. <laughs> so, uh, but your, uh, uh, um, your hospital projects were really amazing. And the way that you subtly used the color there uh, was really fantastic. And the way that it really does affect mood and uh, really does affect your well, well being. I was listening to a, a Russell Brandt podcast the other day about breathing and how important breathing is to your well being and how, uh, how it comes from yoga and, um, the, and it's this incredibly he healing thing. And I think color can be really healing too. So uh, it was really great to see that. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Thank and you. really fantastic congratulations on all your uh, you. work and especially um, the design emergency that you went through. Uh, I can really feel for you. Um, <laughs> and it, again, again, color is very simple, huh? Um, you, we, we all understand it. Blue is for this, red is for that. And in, and in one of these design emergencies, um, it's it's really really key. So uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you. Great thank one you. to finish. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think it's it's kind of weirdly kind of like gone full circular. Like Vanessa's talk about hospitals and sort of bringing it bringing it back yeah. and sort of showing that progression as well. And it's yeah, sort of answering that point. It's like does it have to be grey and drab? And I think he, he demonstrated that it doesn't need to be. So thank you for for wrapping it up. So I'm just gonna share my screen for a couple uh, more minutes just to share some some messages for, from our side so uh, number one thank you so much for giving you time There's a couple of people have had to, to leave because I've got birthdays uh, celebrations to attend so thank you to Laura and Vanessa uh, from before and thank you to everyone else who's been sticking around uh, watching the talks and, and contributing in the chat as well so uh, I really appreciate it I say it's it takes a lot of time and effort in the background to bring everything together, a lot of time and effort on your part to put these talks together, and then it just all knits together quite nicely. So it's always uh, lovely to see it all come together. Um, 
So yeah, kudos and please say thank you to the chat, everyone who's been watching along and this is recorded so you can watch it, watch it back as well. Um, okay, so a couple of things I just want to say is um, Annalise uh, and uh, Wendy kind of went through as kind of almost like our sort of guinea pigs for, for a, a couple of our things that we're doing. So we're, we're helping to try and get more people on stage doing Petrofuture Talk. So we are running kind of infrequently different training sessions. I just realised I'm wearing the same clothes as I was before. And, I do own more clothes uh, than that. Um, but yeah, we try and celebrate uh, everyone's stories. And that's what we said. Everyone's got a story to tell. We want to help do that using the power of Petrocution. So sign up uh, via our link tree links, which are on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, and you can um, go through the process and one day present. Um, this is a QR code. So if you sort of take a, a shot of that, it'll take you straight to the... Um, the form on Google so you can actually sign up and do just a quick questionnaire just to help us steer how these um, this training go. Um, cool. And then next. So our next event, this is a clue. I'll put this here for Kim who sat over there because she likes this TV show. Um, but yeah, the theme is community. I think we kind of had this theme before once for, for Liverpool. Like, well, I was our Liverpool theme, but I think it's such an important theme that I want to kind of circle back to it. And especially since it may very well be our kind of last online event before we go back to in-person events. So I really want to take this as an opportunity to kind of reach out to other parts of the country, which are doing really interesting things to sort of build communities mm -hmm. um, there. And so July, 2021 is what we're going to do for that day. It will be on a Thursday. Uh, starting discussions now about that so so stay tuned uh, for that follow us on our socials and stuff like that uh, and you'll find out more and um, I think that is the last slide so again massive thank you to everyone um, and good hey Kai I just wanted to say thank you to you and all the team at Manchester for putting on this really professional uh, and excellent colourful protection night and thanks to Brogan for helping in the background there for all the te technical uh, support and uh, projector at London and Manchester work very closely together. So thank you. And thank you to all the, you know, really amazing speakers. It's, uh, it was a really, uh, it, it, we, we always say projectors like um, a box of chocolates, you know, you never know quite know what you're gonna get. And there was a really lovely uh, spread of, uh, you know, cr cr creativity uh, there. And, and that notion of community, Pachacha is a really big community where, you know, we, we've touched over a thousand, a thousand two hundred and fifty seven cities now. Um, and it's always great to see the positivity and creativity in each city. And as I said at the beginning, it's really great that we can now drop in and, and other cities can join. And this, these hybrid events will be a key part of Pachacha going forward. Uh, if you check out our website, there's uh, you can you can uh, you can make presentations online now using our Pachacha Create Soft software. Um, and so think about using it in your schools or your offices. It keeps those meetings and these Zoom calls uh, down, you know. Um, people can't, can't, you know, six, six minutes, 40 seconds and you're done, you know. So anyway, thank you, Manchester. Uh, thank you, Kyle and Brogan and everybody. Really fantastic to oh, join Brogan. you today. Yeah. Brogan, do you want to shout out about London? Uh, just our next event will be May 11th with the theme of time. Uh, no link or anything yet, but dry out and send out some information i should say our next tokyo one is going to be the the 21st of april from uh from toggle hotel so up on the Excellent. green floor <laughs> <laughs> all right uh well i think we're, we're going to end it there so i think we can cancel the live stream